from Smart Semiotics. Uh, our speaker today is Sebastian Moreno Barinecci from, uh, from Uruguay, who's going to be speaking to us about his work uh, on the social semiotics of populism. Um, he'll be speaking for around 40 minutes or so, um, and then we'll have some time uh, with our uh, discussants, uh, Jeff Bereshurin, uh, Vasilios uh, Vasilio, uh, Ademidis, uh, and Jan Minkowski. Uh, with uh, some comments towards the end from Parag Brandt. Um, thank you uh, from, uh, from all of us for the support of uh, Zbigniew uh, Rogetska and Gabriel Aroni for the support behind the scenes uh, on the technicalities uh, and making this all run as smoothly as possible. Um, and I think with that, I will hand over to Sebastian uh, to get started. Thanks, Andrew. I will share my screen. Can you see it? Yes, it works nicely. Okay, thank you. Well, uh, to start with, let me uh, apologize for uh, crackling that apparently is, is uh, present in my sound. I'm not sure if, if you can hear it. I hope it doesn't bother much. Um, and also to thank Paul Boisac for the kind invitation of, of being part of this great project called Smart Semiotics. Um, since we met in Thessaloniki a couple of years ago, he has been very, very generous in general, but this invitation is particularly generous. And thanks to the panelists as well as the moderator, everyone, for, for agreeing to join this, this, this adventure. Uh, my name is Sebastián Moreno Barreneche. I, I spell my, my last names in, in capital letters because I usually get confusions regarding if my name is Moreno or my, my, my proper name is Mo, uh, Moreno or Sebastián or, or what, so I try to clarify everything there in the title slide of this presentation called The Social Semiotics of Populism. Um, which is an ongoing research project that um, will hopefully be published by the Bloomsbury um, collection that Paul um, edits uh, in, in, in this publishing house. Here I have, for example, one of the great books that they have edited, uh, The Semiotics of Emoji by Marcel Lanetti. And, and it's, of course, a great pleasure if, if I can make it to be part of, of that family of uh, books. So the biggest challenge uh, to start talking about populism for me is how to be creative. Uh, Francisco Panizza, who, who is a co-national of mine, a, a Uruguayan political scientist who has uh, researched on populism and published uh, a compilation of essays in 2005, um, started the, the, the introduction of that book saying, uh, something like, it's a cliche, it has become a cliche to start talking about populism, lamenting the lack of clarity to the concept. So I will avoid going into that direction for the moment, but I will start as every discussion on populism starts, that is referring to the explosion of populism during the last couple of, of uh, years. And nowadays we have a, a research area that is called populism studies, yeah, and it's it consists of a sort of federation of disciplines gathered together around an object. And recently we have already um, heard some criticism to populism studies. Benjamin Declen and um, Jason Glynos have published recently a, an article called Beyond Populism Studies in which they propose to abandon the hype for this concept because it's quite complicated to understand what populism means given that it means something within the academic scholarship, something different in political discussions, something different when used by the media, and um, we will come back to this in a while. It's true also that 2016 was a key moment for, for, for populism and the study of, of populism, because Brexit took place, Trump was elected, Donald Trump was elected as the president of the United States. Before that, in 2015, Marine Le Pen had a very successful campaign in the French elections. And of course, it's a complex phenomenon because it has been present in Europe, in Latin America, in the United States, and it has been identified both on the right and on the left uh, 
wings of the political spectrum. For semiotics, it's relevant to take into account that since the very beginning of, of the scholarship on populism, as, as we will see in a, in a moment, there have been discur discursive accounts of populism. Right? Like Lau moved the Essex school that grew around them, and some other projects, uh, for example, the Desire Research Center, of, of which I am uh, a family member, let's say, thanks to, to the generosity of Benjamin de Klen, and they have been researching populism from a discursive uh, perspective. And my impression is that in all these approaches, semiotics is completely ignored, except for Ferdinand de Saussure, who wasn't a semiotician. There are some reference to semiotics, to the, the, the word semiotics is used, but it's used in a broad sense to refer to particular issues related to meaning making, but not semiotics as a discipline, and, and, and I will try to, to, to argue why this is a problem in this, in this talk. Finally, what I'm trying to do here with my research and, and what I will do in this, this presentation is a work of articulation. I'm trying to put together some insights from semiotics, political theory, discourse studies, and practical philosophy, amongst other disciplines, to try to approach populism from a specific point of view. I'm not going to, to, I'm not interested in doing this kind of comparatist analysis that requires having a minimal definition of populism. I'm just trying to think how is it that semiotics can approach the phenomenon of populism and shed some light into things that might not be still very clear or at least not very systematic. So in this presentation, I will address four points. The first of them is social semiotics. I think it's important to, to say something about what semiotics is, what social semiotics is. Then a brief reference to populism, because a lot of things have been said about the phenomenon already, and I think it's, it's not necessary to add more on, on, on that um, conceptual verification. Then I will focus on trying to, to sketch a, a social semiotics of the political based on, on previous research. And finally, I will focus on the social semiotics of populism by looking at four key components. The people, the people's other, the leader, and the intended effect of this thing that we call populism. So let's start with social semiotics. So semiotics, uh, of course, as you all, all know or might know, it's a broad field of research and has a wide array of, of objects of study. And we can um, talk in general of texts as, as the object of, of, of semiotics. Uh, but the concept of text was broadened. Yeah? A text is not only a collection of words that creates a coherent meaning, but also other things can be modeled following the text. And this is a problem, of course, because as we will see in this presentation, semiotics or semioticians are studying visual texts, for example, photographs, uh, paintings, but also practices which have, which have nothing to do with the tradition, traditional definition of what a text is. The origins of the discipline are, are to be found in, in Ferdinand de Saussure's Cours de Linguistique Générale. Uh, it's focused on, on the study of science and science systems. Also, Charles Sanders Spears parallelly showed some interest in, in, in science and science systems. Um, and from that, that, that's the, the starting point. Yeah? So the end of the, the 19th century, the beginning of the 20th century is the, the birth moments of, of the discipline that in the second half of the 20th century will become semiotics, a yeah, fully fledged or, or, or a discipline that, that is more consolidated. The issue here is that these took place the moment in which post-structuralism became popular. Yeah. The work of, of Algirdas Greimas and, and those who worked with him in the, in the, the Paris School of Semiotics was more or less simultaneous to the hype of Michel Foucault, Derrida, and other post-structuralist uh, scholars. These post-structuralist scholars are frequently quoted, mentioned by um, different uh, researchers of, of populism. So, Greimas on, one, on the one side, Umberto Eco on the one side, structural ge or generative semiotics on the one side, interpretative semiotics on the other one, are like the two main uh, schools of semiotics, one based on, on Saussure, the other one on, on Pierce. 
but there are also other scholars, Julie Lodman, Michael Holliday, Eliseo Veron, and so on, who have different approaches to, to semiosis. So what's the issue that we have today, 2021? We have a French tradition yeah, that is consolidated around the figure of Grimas, Jean-Marie Floch, uh, Jacques Fontany, and Eric Landowski, just to mention a couple of the most salient names. We have an Italian tradition that grew strong around Umberto Eco, Paolo Fabri, and dozens of researchers that are very active nowadays. We have an English-speaking tradition. The father of this tradition is Charles Sanders Spears. We have Michael Holliday, Hodgen Kress, Theo van Leuven, and the social semiotics, the Canadian school, to call it in, in, in a way, Paul Rusak, Marcel Danesi. There is also a Balti tradition, Yuri Lodman, the Tartu school, some researchers um, carrying on their, their work in, in Finland. There is a Hispanic tradition, Eliseo Verón, this, this Argentinian semiotician, plus this group of, of researchers studying mediatization in Argentina or the University of Sao Paulo in Brazil, focusing on social semiotics, plus a, a strong body of research in Spain, the cultural semiotics, uh, in a group, the, the group of, of the study of, of semiotics of culture, led by Jorge Lozano, who, who recently passed away. And then we have other traditions, of course, Scandinavian tradition, very strong in cognitive semiotics, a German tradition based on the work of Ernst Cassider, and, and the philosophy of the symbolic forms, a Greek tradition working hard on, on the, the, the Thessaloniki, the Aristotle University in Thessaloniki. So we have a very, a very wide um, group of, of, of scholars. And two issues appear here. The first one is the lack of translations. Uh, the dialogue between these traditions or these schools is not always possible. Uh, in, in, in my case, I, I really try to, to teach myself Italian and French to, be uh, to, to have access to, to what's going on in the field of Italian semiotics, for example, or French semiotics. Otherwise, uh, I, I miss what's going on. The second point are these, called, these so-called echo chambers. And every tradition tries to, tries to establish a dialogue with what has been said, written, and done before in that particular tradition. Yeah? So there is a, a, a relevant need to break the silos between, between these two. However, some commonalities are to be found among the different approaches. In the first place, the object. The object of study are not science any longer, normally. Its meaning, its sense, its signification, its semiosis, its discourse. Yeah? It's not about the product of meaning making, sense making, signification. It's more about the process, how meaning emerges, how we see that we can ascribe a meaning to something that comes to, to our perceptive field. The focus then is more on the process or the structure. The method tends to be empirical, working always with a corpus of analysis and a strong idea that is already to be found in Ferdinand de Saussure's School of Linguistic General is that it's the researcher who construct, constructs the object of study. And the toolbox, of course, depends on the tradition. A, a great example, a good example of this, this um, the, the dependency of, of the toolbox and the tradition is the concept of syncretism, uh, which comes from great mass, and the concept of multimodality, which is very popular among the social semiotics of, of Theo van Leeuwen, for example, or, or the English-speaking world. So these um, approaches, the semiotic approach, social semiotics, are constructivist. That means they reject forms of anti-essentialism normally. They are focused or interest to, in studying how meaning emerges, in the process of meaning making, of sense making. There is an assumed distinction between two dimensions, a dimension of the content and a dimension of the expression. Yeah, this is a, a re-elaboration that uh, Louis Hemsleff uh, made of Ferdinand de distinction between the signifier and the signifier. Yeah, but normally, for example, when we read Ernesto Laclau's works on, on populism, we find the distinction between signified and signifier and not that between content, content and expression who might have been more relevant to what he's trying to prove in his, his writing. And there, there are a couple of levels of analysis as well. This is more coming from the French tradition, but has been embraced by, by the Italian, the Hispanic tradition as well, in which there are a couple of levels. 
Uh, I mentioned three here. Yeah? The figurative level that is that of what we can perceive with particular shapes, for example, on a story, some characters with names, a, a visual uh, look. And then the narrative, which is more structural, given that it's not about the characters themselves, but the relationships between the characters, and then what is called the basic uh, dimension or the, the, the level of the deep structures, which is the one that is systemized in, 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 in Garimas semiotics, where yeah, what we see in this very, very basic dimension of meaning making is a relation between a, a set of logic uh, relations between different terms. And this will be useful when we try to approach the phenomenon of populism, as, it, as I will try to show later on. So social semiotics is the area of general semiotics that focuses on social and cultural issues. This can be practices, interactions, memory, conflict, forms or styles of life, space, gastronomy, and many other phenomena. And this is a blooming area of research. In every domain of semiotics, we see scholars that are trying to broaden the, so the scope of the research. They are trying to do interdisciplinary work, for example, by establishing dialogues with anthropology, sociology, psychology, cultural geography, amongst others. And I find this quote by Eric Landowski, Landowski that is one of the, the most visible researchers nowadays in the field of social semiotics, and like him. He says, today, besides the analysis of meaning invested in texts and discourses, semiotics claims to account for the way how sense emerges from daily life and lived experience with its many dim dimensions from our sensitive relations with the world around and with the objects we use, in a world from all kinds of human practices. During the last two decades, in order to reach this scope, the discipline developed as a general theory of sense production through interaction. And of course, this approach has its basis in, in the work of Claude Lévi-Strauss, yeah, this uh, anthropology structural from 1958, then Clifford Hirsch and the, the, the approach to culture that he defends in the interpretation of cultures. Yeah? Culture is a, can be read as a text. Cultural practices are texts that the anthropologist needs to read and interpret from about the, the shoulder of, of uh, individuals that carry them uh, out. And finally, Umberto Eco, with his uh, a theory of, of semiotics, the Tratato di Semiotica Generale from 1976, where he equals a general theory of semiotics with a general theory of culture. Yeah? Signification and communication are the pillars of culture. So studying culture means doing semiotics. Good. That's to start with, and I think it's relevant to, to mention this because something that um, calls my attention every time I start reading a, a book or a study on semiotics is that the researcher normally chooses one current, one school, and doesn't even mention the others. Yeah? So that's why I think it's important to try to see how this can, um, this can uh, establish a dialogue. This is precisely what Umberto Eco tried to, to do in, in his uh, theory of semiotics. And with the main two, the main two um, scholarly traditions, the interpretative uh, associated to the figure of Charles Sanders Peirce and the structural or, or generative uh, mass coming from Saussure and so on. Good, about populism, a, a couple of things. The, the, the first one is, as I mentioned at the very beginning of, of my talk, the lack of conceptual clarity. There have been a lot of publications, a lot of discussions around what populism is, and there are some core elements that are agreed upon, but there is still no clarity about the, the, the genus, for example, what thing is populism. And there are multiplicity of approaches linked to disparate research objects and interests. For example, the idea of populism as an ideology, and particularly a thin central ideology. This is the idea sustained by, by uh, Cass Mude, Rob, uh, Cristobal Rovira Calvasar, and, and probably this is the most dominant one in, in, in the field of scholarly research. I mean, for me, the fact that the Oxford's very short introduction um, edition of populism is co-authored by Mude and Rovira Calvasar shows how this definition has become mainstream. And this makes sense because it's very useful for, for comparatist um, political or comparative political uh, scientists. Populism has been defined as a political strategy, for example, in the, in the works of Kurt Weiland, 
as liberal democracy, recently by Takis Papas, as a political logic. Uh, this is something that Benjamin de Klein, for example, has, has written about recently. Uh, populism has been seen as a communicative style, as a performance, as a, a rhetoric, as a frame. Paris Asanis, for example, has, has written all this, or populism as a discourse. Yeah? So the, the, the ones that are marked in, in red have something to do with semiotics. Yeah? When we talk about a communication style or a performance or a rhetoric or a frame or this, because we're dealing with objects that are very close to semiotics. However, in studying them, the reference to semiotics are, are not always there. When studying populism, I think there are three books that are foundational of, of the scholarly work on populism. Populism is not something that emerged during the 20th century. There are some, some manifestations of populism in, in Russia, in the United States at the end of the, of the 19th century. However, the first relevant books, or I wouldn't say relevant, but maybe those that are uh, uh, impossible not to read when researching populism is a volume published in 1969 by UNESCO and Gellner, Populism, Its Meaning and National Characteristics. There are a couple of articles that are always quoted. Peter Worsley, for example, has an article there. Um, but well, I, I can't remember the, the second relevant name. Then we have Ernesto Laclau uh, in 1977, I think it was, he published this Politics and Ideology in Marxist Theory, and, and he has a chapter on, on populism. And finally, Margaret Canovan with populism. Yeah, that was a, the, the starting point for a, a research program that, that uh, developed al along the, the decades. So it's important to understand that since the very beginning of scholarly interest in populism, Discourse theory was there, discourse was there, yeah? and particularly the work of Ernesto Laclau, and it's always a discussion if I should pr pronounce it Laclau or Laclau, yeah? because it's a French name, but he was an Argentinian scholar. He had in 1977 this towards a theory of populism, then Laclau and Mouffe published together in 1985 Hegemony and Socialist Strategy, which became a, a manifesto of, of discourse theory. Then we have a chapter on Panisa's book by Laclau, Populism was in a name, and finally in 2005 on populist reason. And in all this theorization about what populism is, we come across the expressions of empty signifiers, discourse, and there are relevant remarks that we show now in, in hegemony and socialist strategy in the third chapter, articulation and discourse, the word of articulation, fixation of meaning, antagonism, all, th all these things have been theorized thematized research by semiotics as well. A couple of quotations from Hegemony and Socialist Strategy and the work co-authored by Laclau and Mouffe, published in 1985 and re-edited in 2001. They say in a moment, we cannot enter here in all the complexities of a theory of discourse as we understand it, but we should at least indicate the following basic points. And there, they mention a couple of issues, for example, that every object is constituted as an object of discourse. Yeah, this doesn't mean that everything is um, subjective or, or ideational. There are objects here in the world, but how people make sense of them depends on the mediation of discourses. Meaning is attributed to objects depending on the structuring of a discursive field. Without discourse, there is no constitution of objects. And these cursive structures have a material character. They are not only mental things. Yeah? They can be touched, let's say, or, or empirically perceived. They also say that the linguistic and non-linguistic elements are not merely just supposed, but constitute a differential and structure system of positions. That is a discourse. Yeah? They define discourse as a differential and structure system of positions. And this, of course, were semioticians or, or, or researchers working in the field of, uh, of language and discourse, it immediately needs to bring about the idea of a system of difference that was already to be found in Saussure, re-elaborated by Kemslev, and thematized, for example, by Umberto Eco. This, this example on the right, the little square, is something that uh, Kemslev argued. You know, we, we have different languages, Danish, uh, German, and, and uh, French, and different portions of meaning are covered by different manifestations in the dimension of the expression. Yeah? And the value or the meaning of each of these concepts depends on its position in the 
uh, structure of or on this system. Yeah? The practice of articulation, say Laclon or Laclau, and move uh, as fixation, this location of a system of differences cannot consist of purely phenom linguistic phenomena, but must instead pierce the entire material density of the multifarious institutions, rituals, and practice through which a discursive formation is structured. And this is an extension of this idea of discourse or language as a system of articulations to other fields of meaning, such as those of practices, uh, rituals, and institutions. Finally, two more, more quotes from, from Laclau. I think it's important to uh, I insist on this because it's, it's important to trace how the idea of, of discourse is constitutive of, of um, what they say. And I will see in a while that it's very close to what um, semioticians have said about this source. It is important to observe that the equivalence constituted through communist enumeration is not the discursive expression of a real movement constituted outside this course. On the contrary, this enumerative discourse is a real force which contributes to the modeling and constitution of social relations. Right? So it's not that this course expresses a couple of things. For example, in Marxism, there is something called a working class and discourse expresses that class. No, classes are constituted by discursive practice. And in um, 2005b, that's um, on populist reason, Leclerc says in a moment that discourse is any complex of elements in which relations play the constitutive role, whatever centrality an element acquires, it has to be explained by the play of differences as such. So, the commonalities between the different approaches, have, there have been a couple of commonalities identified in, despite the different focuses that uh, research traditions have ascribed to populism. Panitza says, while there is no scholarly agreement on the meaning of populism, it is possible to identify an analytical core around which there is a significant degree of academic consensus. And this, is constituted normally, I mean, when, when we read any paper or book on populism, we find always a reference to the people as the main category of meaning, to the idea of popular or general will and sovereignty as the normative principle to structure the social and political field. An antagonism with an other, yeah, someone that is not part of the people, and the leader as the representative of the people. Yeah, these are the main ideas. There are others about uh, moralism and homogenization. We will come back to them in a way. But before, I want to say something about the social semiotics of the political. That is, what is it that semiotics has said or can say about political phenomena? So we know that Laclau and Mouffe have uh, use the concept of antagonism, the idea that the political field is structured around an us-them dichotomy, the importance of having an enemy. Yeah, this is something that, that uh, Mouffe has insisted on um, by using some insights for, uh, taken from Carl Schmitt, the, the German philosopher. Paolo Fabri, um, in an article from 1985, uh, uh, Political discourse, I think it's, it's the name, speaks also of, of, of politics as, as a discursive field of confrontation, and he used the metaphor of war where there are adversaries. Eric Landowski more recently has insisted in the idea of semiotics trying to detect which are the underlying syntaxes or, 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 or the grammar of power relations that can be found in every possible political situation and of course focusing on, on his main object of interest that are interactions. Eliseo Veron, we'll, we'll come to, to him back in, 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 in the next slide, he argued already in the 1980s that this discursive field is constituted also by adversaries and that it's a key field for the management of identities in the long term. That's why for him mediatization poses a challenge because that means that the logic of, of marketing is, is uh, replacing the logic of, of identity management, which is less immediate. Very, very recently, Peter Selvig and Andreas Wenzel, representatives of, of this uh, 
of the Baltic uh, tradition of semiotics have published a very interesting book on political semiotics in which they mix relational analysis or relational sociology with political analysis and they establish a connection between Ernesto Laclau's theory and, and Euler. So in the semiosis social or social semiosis in English, I think this, this text has never been translated into, into English, Eliseo Verón identifies a double, double hypothesis underlying the study of social discourses. And he says, A, any production of sense is necessarily social. And B, any social phenomenon is, in one of its constitutive dimensions, a process of production of sense. And the author argues that it is in semiosis that the reality of the social is constructed. And I find amazing how uh, in uh, hegemony and socialist strategy, like Clauen move right, literally. Every social practice is therefore, in one of its constitutive dimensions, articulatory. And articulation is the construction of nodal points with partially fixed meaning. So for me, it's fantastic that both of them being Argentinians, having studied more or less at the same time in the University of Buenos Aires, they never managed to cross their approaches to, to, to social discourses and discourse because they are, as you can see in these two quotes, saying more or less the same. Some formulations in one of its constitutive dimensions is the same formulation. Good. So the social semiotics of, of the political it's something that Eliseo Verón presented in an article uh, from 1987 um, in which he studies the political field and he focuses on enunciation. He says, okay, we have to track how these courses uh, let themselves see in enunciation. And then he identifies that in every act of enunciation, there are three collective actors. The pro-destinatory, yeah, and in classic us, we want to do this, we have to do that, and the, the key mechanism here is self-identification. Secondly, there is a counter-destinatory, them, those that are not us, and we, of course, need to make them in, invert their beliefs. And finally, the para-destinatory, which is the group of the undecided, and the main mechanism here is persuasion. Yes, so collective actors are inescapable from any approach to the semiotic, to, to the political field. Because political action is conceived as a struggle or a, a contest over the fixation of meaning. Yeah, we can discuss from different disciplines what politics is, what's the point of political activity. But from a semiotic perspective, there is a clash of discourses. Yeah, there is a clash of exchanges that aim at fixating particular worldviews. So when looking at the, semi at the political from a semiotic perspective, there are a couple of aspects to pay attention to. Who are the actors, individual, collective? What are their objectives, declared, actual? What is their relation between these actors? What is the plot, the narrative, the story, the myth, whatever you want to, to call it, that underlies the interactions between them? Which roles are attributed to these actors in that narrative? And here, of course, the key principle is that that has been called the principle of narrativity, which is central for cognitive semiotics. Yeah, the idea that organization of experience, events, perception takes place in narrative terms. We make sense of the surrounding and the internal reality by means of narrative. Yeah, this idea has been researched by Jerome Brunner, very recently Claudio Paulucci has, has published a book on, on the topic. Pera Gebrand, of course, has, has, has well dealt with this topic in a, in a very, very recent book. Good, so after this uh, introduction that I think it's relevant, it's not an introduction, but I think it's relevant to, to see which are the pillars sustaining the, the, the semiotic approach to populism, we will focus now on, in the social semiotics of, of populism. So when talking about populism as an object of study, the question is what are we looking for and what are we looking at? And I think it's very interesting to approach populism from a semiotic perspective by having in mind the lang parole distinction that was still found in Ferdinand de Saussure, uh, of course, the linguistic general. There are multiple paroles, uh, the concrete acts of, of uh, language, let's say, but there is one lang, this system of rules, that is an abstraction based on induction. Yeah? We can, for example, in Spanish, there are different manifestations of Spanish. Uh, I, as a Uruguayan, speak. Uh, Sorry? Chirinho? Ah, yeah, okay. 
so the, the, the difference um, between the Spanish I speak as, a, as someone coming from Uruguay is very different to what people in Spain speak or different regions of Spain. However, we speak of a lang, some abstraction called Spanish. Uh, Jan Simkowski and, and Ruth Brees in, in the introduction to a fantastic volume from 2019 called Imagining the Peoples of Europe write that there is no such thing as a prototypical populism. And this we will see is the case. There is no one Spanish of populism. There are different uh, occurrences of populism. However, there are some elements that are common to all manifestations of populism, and I will focus now on these four. The people, the people's other, the leader, and the intended effects. And these are only a couple of them. There could be other ways of, of, of um, uh, adding to this analytical core. About the people. The people is an empty signifier. This is something that is agreed on, 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 on different scholarly traditions. That means that it's a manifestation, an imprint, something that we can understand, but we have to think about what the signified is. So people is meaningful, the people is a meaningful category of meaning, but it's not always sure, or it's not always um, unequivocal what it refers to. There are multiple references. The demos, that is the political group that constitutes the society, the popular classes, the crowds, yeah? Whatever we have in mind when we think of the people, what I think is undeniable is that we are talking about an identity as the signifier. That means the people refers to an identity. Its content is an identity, a complex word. Yeah? But it's necessary that semiotics continues working on semiotics of identities, and particularly of collective identities. Yeah, there are some words on, for example, the semiotics of the body and how the body is relevant for the personal identity, but for collective identities, things are different. Why? Because in the case of the I, of the self, I am embodied, yeah? One anchorage for my construction or the construction of my personal identity is based on the fact that I have a body, that I look somehow. In the case of the we, that is a collective identity, every collective identity is always imagined. We, the participants in this, in this seminar, we can think of, okay, there is an us, those that participate in the, uh, in the seminar, but we are imagining that bond. Yeah? And this is something that, that Benedict Anderson already pointed out in, in his book from 1983, Imagine Community. Constructivism is the key principle or the key tenet of this approach. Identities are not anything given essential, but they are constructed, they are coherent discursive articulations. An identity is a set of portions of discourse that are presented as systemic, as coherent. So the people have a broad semantic field, yeah, which, which is the core of this identity, of this group, which are the boundaries. There is the issue of number as well. This is a funny thing whenever I try to translate this to, to other languages. Yeah. The people yeah, in, in, in English is, uh, requires a plural. The people are. Yeah. In Spanish, for example, when I translate the people to la gente, is la gente es in singular. And there is a problem of translation. We have, for example, what in English is the people. In Spanish can be el pueblo o la gente. In, in, in French, le peuple, le jean, el popolo, la gente. In, in Italian, das Volk, die Leute, die Menschen in, in, in German. So one concept that in a language that is a mainstream language nowadays in, in this uh, research field loses nuances that are to be found in different and different um, languages. Yeah? So it's, it's a, co a problematic concept. I bring an example here from Jose Mujica, Uruguay's previous president. You might have heard of him. In 2015, when he left uh, in his discourse, he said, dear people, thank you for your wisdom. Thank you for your criticism. Thank you for your love. And above all, thank you for your deep companionship. Every time I felt alone during my presidency. Yeah? There is a people, pueblo in Spanish. Yeah? But I think here's something very different. For example, when we read this discourse from Donald Trump, yeah, my opponent asks her supporters to recite a free word loyalty pledge. It reads, I'm with her. I choose to recite a different pledge. My pledge reads, I'm with you, the American people. 
I am your voice, I am with you, I will fight for you, and I will win for you. We will make America great again. God bless you. God bless you and good night. I love you. Donald Trump in, the, in a rally before his, his, in the election. So in the first case, we wouldn't call Mujica a populist only because he uses the term pueblo or, or the people. In this case, we might say, okay, Donald Trump is using a populist rhetoric here. So by using this, the semiotic square of Grimas, I think we might be in a, in a good position to understand what populism um, attempts or, or, or tries to do in segmenting the social reality. They, populism segments and identifies the people yeah, as, a, as a particular group and then constructs through a process of actualization a subject, someone who can be identified and referred to a process of generalization takes place as well. Yeah, there is a generalization. Some features are imagined as being held by every member of that imagined group. And then the famous process of axiologization, a value is attributed to that people, the moralization that some scholars have identified as well. This process takes in relation, relational terms. To, for there to be a people, there needs to be an outgroup. Yeah, and we need a them, and those them are those who are not us. You can see the red example, the, the red, let's say, imagine that the ball in the middle is the imagined group or collective identity of the people, and there are different groups outside. They might be different, they might have nothing in common, but based on their existence is that we can pose a we. And of course here affect the idea of generalizations, the idea of polarization play a key role. And all these elements are central to populism. The mechanism, I think it's, 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 it's interesting to see it on, on a semiotic square. Let's say, for example, that I am a politician. I want to, to create a populist movement in Uruguay. And I say, OK, there is a group called the people. Yeah? We are the people. So there is a group, the contrary term is those who are not the people. Yeah? But I cannot create a campaign saying, oh, we the people against those who are not the people. So we need to identify a complementary term, something that can be posed as an enemy, let's say the elite. And the semiotic process of transforming the not us, not the people into a positive identity, that's very interesting as well. Because it implies transforming a negativity, not something into a positivity. Yeah? And of course, this is a process of simplification. I will show why now. That's how the elite or the establishment, this idea of a vertical hierarchy, some people with power, some people that are dispossessed, comes into, into being. As an example, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm about to finish now. As an example, um, I have this quotation from Stavrakakis and Katambekis when they study Siritsa. They say, the enemy of the people, that is the pro-austerity forces, the memorandum, the troika, and so on, in this discourse, all these forces, also organized through an equivalential logic, were presented as distinct but interrelated moments of the establishment. Sirita, this course, thus divided the social space into two opposing camps. Them, the establishment, the elite, and us, the people, power, and the underdog, the elite, and the non-privileged, those up, and the others down. And the mechanism following the logic I, following the logic I just presented is this. There is a we and multiple groups that are not we, a category and identity is created, the establishment, and these different identities, some of them, not all, maybe that's, that's not a, 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 an ideal representation, are through a logic of equivalence, equivalence, establish us another identity. And that's how we achieve to the us and them, two different collective identities following what Beron said about political discourse. So finally, to close, the leader is a key figure in populism because the leader embodies the people. They do not represent the people as, to claim, as they normally claim, I am the representative of the people, or I am the people, or I am with you, as, as Donald Trump said, but they model it. Yeah? That's why manners, the style of communication, the use of language, normally dialect, slang, bad words, the use of and, and staging of the body, the clothing, impertinence, political incorrectness, all these are semiotic resources that reflect identification strategies. Yeah? These are closer to the people, and that's why, or, or 
how the people are imagined, and that's why they are used. There is, as Eric Landowski has argued in a couple of articles, an aesthetic, aesthetic, aesthetic involvement of the leader with the people. Yeah? And this aesthetic, this sen sensible involvement, this idea of using the body to be close, generates the illusion of an immediate proximity of an intimate link between them. An example was Marine Le Pen, honneur du peuple. Yeah? She is there representing the people. Paul Iglesias, an example of not wearing a tie and the, 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 the appearance in, in, in political events as a way of identifying and molding the people. When Donald Trump, for example, in, his, in one of the first discourses about the, corona, the coronavirus, uh, crossed uh, at the word uh, novel virus or coronavirus and wrote Chinese virus, the political incorrectness. You might not know who the, the guy on the right is, that's Gerardo Núñez, a member of the parliament in Uruguay, who decided that to prove some point he would attend parliament wearing a t-shirt of Cuba. Yeah, he is not a populist, but this probably is the same that populist leaders are doing to stage these acts of social non-conformity, yeah? These are not serious, these are not very bad, yeah? But they are spectacular, they produce effect and meaning, yeah? And that's why Sela and Demuru, Francisco Sela and Paolo Demuru, say that populism has an implosive character because breaking the norms that are sedimented in a specific time is the way of making, of producing sense that is appealing to the people. Yeah, that's why the destruction of the background and on stage distinction is central in populism. There is not a public sphere or, a, or a, a private sphere any longer. Things get mixed and that's why populism consists of a set of strategies that try to establish a bond between a representative and a, an imagined collective identity. I will jump this and, and pass to, to the conclusions and I will be done in, in, in two minutes. So when we look at this, all the conceptions that exist of what populism is, we see that we can fit them together yeah? because ideology and discourse are not exclusive terms. Yeah? In the last part of the theory of, of a theory of semiotics, Humberto Eco shows or says something about ideology. Elisio Verón has dealt with this as well. So, there is a, a way of, of finding um, and accom of accommodating all these different and, and apparently antagonistic or, or, or incompatible definitions of what populism is. I think that it's wise to think of populism as an ingredient to be found in political movements. Instead of asking if a movement is populist or not, we should ask what is what its degree of populism is, as Benjamin de Klein has, has argued recently. Um, and if I had to go for a definition, I would say, okay, populism is perhaps a narrative configuration, but it's a system of structures with some rules, with multiple manifestations in the dimension of the expression. And that's why we can talk of a rhetoric, communicative style performance. This narrative configuration that works as a model, as a plot, or as a mold for, for the creation of stories, takes different forms depending on the context. Yeah? And the important thing is that this goes beyond the field of, of, of politics. Well, that would be it. Uh, I'm sorry for, for the last part was a bit condensed, but I think the, the spirit of, of what I wanted to say um, was there. Thank you very much for, for your attention. Thank you very much. Uh, a really fascinating uh, talk and um, yeah, provides a, an interesting new way of, of kind of interpreting and thinking about the things that are, are happening around us at the moment. I uh, look forward to reading uh, in more detail um, your ideas in your in your forthcoming book. I'm sure it's going to be a fantastic addition to the series. Um, I should quickly say, if anyone does have any questions, um, you can use the Q&A button uh, at the bottom of the, the Zoom screen. If we have time, we'll try and answer some of them towards the end of, of the session. But uh, for now, I'd like to introduce our first uh, Jeff Vashuren uh, from the University of Antwerp. Jeff, over to you. Okay. <clears throat> so, am I audible? Yep. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Now, um, I think I'm going to be uh, a pretty boring discussant because there is not very much that I can disagree with from the fascinating exposition that uh, Sebastian has just given. 
Um, actually, there isn't even much of a difference between the field he's coming from and the field I'm coming from. So uh, my field, for those of you who may not know it, is linguistic pragmatics. And of course, linguistic pragmatics has its uh, basis in a wider field of semiotics as well. And we are all concerned equally with the process of generating meanings. So for me, that's actually the basis of what language use is all about. And the main difference between social semiotics and linguistic pragmatics is very simply that linguistic pragmatics takes linguistic utterances as a starting point. But of course, it has to take into account just about everything else as well, if we are really concerned about how meanings get generated. Now, um, having said that, um, the um, understanding of populism that we just heard, and, and I'm very happy with the, the, the final sentences that uh, Sebastian uttered, namely, uh, he said at the very end that, in fact, populism should be looked at as an ingredient to be found in political movements rather than as an identifiable object or movement itself. And, um, okay, that's one of the reasons why I'm going to be a boring uh, discussant, because that's exactly the starting point that I wanted to take as well. Namely, uh, I regard what is commonly called populism in the Trumpian sense, um, what is commonly regarded as populism, I regard it as an outgrowth, basically, of a much more general affliction of politics in liberal democracies in general at this very moment. And this affliction is something that I call derailed reflexivity. Now, <clears throat> what is this derailed reflexivity? We, we all know that reflexivity is an essential ingredient of social life. We have to constantly reflect on how what we say is being interpreted by the people we are talking to. We have to be trying constantly to look into other people's minds, even to know exactly what it is that we should say to get across a kind of meaning that we want to communicate. So reflexivity is an essential ingredient of communicative processes. But at a certain moment, within social institutional contexts, reflexivity can somehow derail. What do I mean by that is that there is a, that sometimes there is a tendency to pay more attention to a form of impression management than to the content of what it is that we are dealing with. So that, in fact, we start to develop activities at some kind of a meta level. And we do this in very many different domains. We do this, for instance, in academia. So we're under pressure from all kinds of neoliberal movements. We have been more and more forced to start counting publications, counting citations. Uh, we are concerned about rankings and so on and so forth, which in a very essential way starts to influence the way in which we work as academics. So our work as academics is to a certain extent guided by phenomena that have nothing to do or considerations that have nothing to do with the essence of our academic work. In the same way, in other fields, like in the media, for instance, editors of journals and, uh, and newspapers are well, very often it seems like they are more concerned about what they think it is that the audience wants than with the essential task that they have to perform, namely the task of informing people. And <clears throat> the same happens in politics, where more and more in po politics seems to have become a, what in French would be called a politique d'opinion, a politics of opinion, where 
it is not so much an attempt on the side of, of politicians, which if they have, of course, always done, not so much an attempt anymore of trying to influence politic, uh, public opinion, but much more an attempt to try and get onto the wavelength of what politicians assume is the content of public opinion and trying to get onto that wavelength uh, in a way uh, in which they, which they then translate into very simple kind of kinds of messages that uh, <clears throat> that are very easy to mm -hmm. stick to. Think, for instance, about uh, well, okay, the, the the most simplistic version that we've uh, encountered in the last half decade is, of course, "Make America Great Again." Now, it is this kind of message which when staying on message, uh, a politician is trying to use to stay on the wavelength of what he or she assumes to be a general mood within a population, uh, in, which helps them to, of course, uh, translate this then into electoral success and so on. And this is politics for me at a meta level. It is politics that is not so much concerned about what politicians should be doing, namely caring for society, but it is, but it is uh, a different level of activity altogether, a derailment of reflexivity in my terminology. Now, and then the next step, and, and this is the, the kind of thing that lots of politicians are doing, and not only those whom we call populists, it's not only the Bolsonaros and not only the Trumps of this world who do this. It is also done by, a, in, my, in my view of what I see happening in the political world, it is done by, a, let's say, within liberal democracies, by a majority of politicians. And you get very good examples of that, like, for instance, when uh, on a recent occasion, the last, well, not the last time, but the previous time when Mark Rutte in the Netherlands, when he got his electoral victory, uh, he contrasted this with the Brexit victory and the Trumpist uh, victory. Um, and he said, well, now finally we have shown that uh, we can beat the wrong kind of populism. <laughs> now, okay, I don't think it was his, uh, his conscious intention to admit that he was trying to be a populist as well, but basically, well, that's what it amounted to. Now, and, it, and only the next step that is then taken by people who get into this uh, truly populist category, the next step is very simply to present oneself as the representative of the people. And uh, there we get to this empty signifier in Sebastian's term terminology, so the people. And um, as soon as you get to an opposition between the people whom you are supposed to represent in opposition to, for instance, elites, who would not be representing the people, um, you can no longer avoid uh, identity politics. So, um, and, and once you get into the identity politics, unfortunately, also those prototypical uh, populists, if at least I'm allowed to talk about prototypical populists, um, then, there's prototypical populists. Well, they do basically, uh, except that, uh, that they oppose themselves also to other political elites. Hmm? Uh, they do basically the same, the same thing as what I see happening in very many liberal democracies at this moment. Namely, um, you see a movement to uh, do a form of identity politics that, um, that contrasts itself to earlier movements that were called multiculturalist. And you saw this happening with major politicians like 
Angela Merkel, with uh, Sarkozy, with Cameron, uh, who all declared the, um, uh, well, the um, unsuccessfulness of multiculturalism. Huh? And this is a, a kind of, uh, um, and, and on the, in, in, their, in that same uh, direction, well, many, many people are simply declaring now, many intellectuals also, that they are simply now speaking the truth about differences between cultures and the need for people to um, adapt, even if they avoid that terminology sometimes, they also avoid the terminology of assimilation, but basically it is assimilation that is very much defended by a very wide range of political movements in liberal democracies at this moment. And this is all a, a shared form of identity politics, which you do not only find in the most populist uh, political movements of the moment, but which is much more general than that. And I see that my 10 minutes is up, so I, I stick. Uh, okay, I'll stop here and let the others talk. Thank you very much for that, Jeff. Um, Vasilios, yeah, um, great. your thoughts, please. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrew. Uh, first of all, uh, huge congratulations to Sebastian for this fascinating talk. Um, he clarified uh, many concepts and uh, gave us the background of the links between uh, populism uh, and uh, social semiotics. And uh, very many thanks to Jeff as well for his uh, very thoughtful comments. So my starting point uh, is slightly different, I believe, from the rest, in the sense that I have a low background and I have an interest in classics as well. And uh, studying the classical Athenian democracy, I would like to identify similarities between the modern concept, chameleonic, I would say, concept of populism, and whether this could apply to uh, types of regimes that do not share much in common with uh, liberal democracies. So in the process, I think that I have identified some striking similarities uh, with classical Athenian democracy in particular and the concept of the demos, the concept of the ancient concept of the people back then, uh, in the sense that uh, the demos back then was, uh, uh, had become the establishment, which is particularly, particularly important as modern populism usually is a, a movement at the, a protest movement at the margins of, uh, or at least it represents itself uh, being on the margins of the political uh, arena. Uh, but the ancient demos actually had um, uh, believed for itself the concept of a pure people uh, represented mainly by the lower classes. So the concept of the demos began as a social group being at the margins of the society and gradually gained influence mm -hmm. until it uh, got the power to uh, be, to, to form a democratia, which means power for the people or of the people. And also uh, roughly around the second part of uh, the fifth century BC, uh, for those who are uh, a little bit familiar with uh, classical Athenian democracy, it's the time of the Peloponnesian War. So it's a time of crisis, both economic, social, and also identity crisis. We have the demos, which was in power, being represented by the so-called demagogues. So these demagogues, actually the literal phrase that they used for themselves was the protector of the demos. So mm -hmm. they presented themselves both as the protector of the interests of the demos, but also as the voice of the people, and sometimes as the embodiment of the people. And actually, they projected the interests of the people, of the pure people, against the interests of a corrupt elite, being corrupt in the sense that they undermined the Athenian Empire and they wanted to, um, they, they were pro Spartan. They were traitors in a sense. 
they wanted to collaborate with the enemies, and uh, they were morally impure and corrupt, which is particularly striding, striking because we see in this ancient democracy uh, many of the features of modern populism being present. So I come from a slightly different angle here, uh, and I also research the impact of populism on the legal systems of democracy with particular reference uh, to the uh, effort, the attempt of populism to ingrain old meanings with uh, old terms and concepts with new meanings. So I think, I tend to think that uh, populists are not very creative in developing new concepts or new terms, but they use old terms, but they try to ingrain them with new meanings. And we can see that in words like um, popular sovereignty or people that they use for the pure people or even the rule of law. So when the, let's say, mainstream politicians argue that populism goes against the rule of law, populists reply by saying, no, we can actually go with the rule of law, but not your rule of law, what you mean by the rule of law. So they sometimes use old terms, they twist their meaning, and they try to adapt the new meaning to what the people think. So for example, uh, when populists say that they uh, argue for a return to a real democracy. They use the term democracy, but they ingrain a new meaning in that. And actually, they have an audience that they truly believe, they truly believe that, yes, democracy, uh, as uh, in the form of a liberal democracy that respects the rule of law and quite often has the rule of law as the most important feature and criterion in the lawmaking process, uh, otherwise we could end up with extreme majoritarianism. Uh, so many people say that uh, in an effort to protect the rights of the minorities, for example, or to protect the rule of law, the will of the people is not respected. So this is not real democracy. And populists take advantage of this and they use the old term, which is often morally charged, whether positively or negatively sometimes, so democracy is a moral, is a positively charged term, and they give them, give democracy a meaning which uh, responds to the wishes of the people, or to the wishes at least of the uh, people who believe they use the common sense to interpret these uh, these words. Uh, another important thing is the use of metonymy that uh, populists use in their rhetoric. So uh, again, to give you an example, uh, when you referred to uh, the uh, uh, quote about the Syriza government in Greece uh, and the uh, Katsambekis study from uh, 2014, they didn't use words that are clear on their meanings, such as, for example, traitors, although in the social media back then in Greece, this was the word used by those believing in the populist ideas, but they use the word, uh, the pro-austerity groups, uh, they use the word memorandum, uh, they use the word troika, or the local, uh, we would say the local uh, minions of the troikans, they tended to refer to the political establishment back then by these words. So instead of using a clear word, which will offer them nothing apart from, you know, the, the signifier of uh, a particular uh, of a particular practice, they choose to refer to the uh, to metonymy, to symbols, to signs in order to reach a larger audience. Yeah. If they reach this larger audience, then the interpretation of the words that they use will be uh, 
very uh, will be uh, very personal. So if you say that these people collaborate with the Troika, then the Troika as a term will be interpreted by each individual in a different way, but always in the negative. So instead of giving a clear meaning to the word, you let your audience assign a meaning by interpreting a more abstract term and using their fantasy in order to interpret a term at whim and according to their wishes. So um, I, I believe, you know, that populism is not very creative in that sense, but they're very creative in the process of assigning mm -hmm. new meanings or of letting the uh, common sense people assign meanings to terms. And this is why they have this chameleonic nature. And uh, to conclude with this, uh, with this remark, I tend to think that um, unless the populists themselves um, accept this label and uh, identify themselves a few common features that uh, they all agree on, I think that populism will still remain a chameleonic concept whose meaning is projected by the mainstream politicians, the mainstream media, the mainstream academics who investigate this phenomenon, but they are not part of this phenomenon. So thank you very much for listening. And I will be at your disposal for any comments. <laughs> thank you very much, uh, Asilios. Um, Sebastian, we've got maybe a couple of minutes if there was anything you wanted to say in response. Otherwise, we can we can quickly move on. Uh, thank you, Jeff and, and, and Vasileo, for, for the great comments. Um, I agree with everything what, what you have said. I, I just thought it came to my mind. I don't know if you know the, the series, uh, Four More Years. It's on Netflix now. And then there is a character called Vivian Rook, portrayed by Emma Thompson, which is fantastic. And it's a great example because it's uh, a fictional character that is a 100% representative of populism. Uh, so it's interesting to see the things that, that I mentioned and the things how she, she deals with identity, the us and them, how she deals with using words with previous meanings. And, and that is what it's called in semiotics, bricolage. No? It's trying to use things from the past to create new or uh, meaningful articulations. Um, and, and yeah, and about the chameleonic nature, of course, it is something that, that has been uh, identified. And just wanted to say one of my intentions was to mention Basileo's studies as well on, on, on how the judges or, or how the, the equivalent to the lawyers try to, to, to use rhetoric, populist rhetoric with, with the judges in, in uh, classic Athens, because I think it's an interesting case of how populism not necessarily is political in the sense of the political, but can happen within a family as well. There can be populist strategies or populism within a, a neighborhood community or whatever that doesn't necessarily to be democratic politics or, or involving the demos, right? It can be a different group. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Thanks very much. Um, our next right. discussion. Oh, mm -hmm. yes. Just a little <laughs> comment, uh, Andrew. Uh, I think this is a very uh, fruitful and uh, wonderful discussion and I have so much to say uh, but I have to leave in one minute uh, so uh, I would suggest if uh, if I'm right uh, all participants here have a really a lot of, of fine points to make and uh, we need to savor them we need really to to study uh, for example uh, uh, Jeff's uh, uh, problems, uh, problematization of identity, the problematization of the uh, empty signifier and how to empty a signifier, the problem of, of uh, uh, symbols uh, that have floating meaning, etc. Maybe this is related to the signifier. 
uh, the problem of sovereignty, the problem of uh, the possible absence of a political level, etc. Wonderful things to to develop. Couldn't we also have an extra session where we also invite uh, uh, some French semioticians from from uh, the Paris group? <clears throat> Like Landowski, for example, I, I, I know he's very active uh, on uh, video conferencing from Sao Paulo. <laughs> uh, so why is he not uh, with us right now? I, I would uh, well also suggest that uh, my group from, uh, from Jelmslev's uh, inheritance in Denmark, you know, I uh, worked at the group of... Uh, Semioticians at the University of Aarhus developing uh, what we call a cognitive semiotics, which has uh, a lot of points uh, already made on populism, etc. Uh, it would be nice to to work out a lot of of these uh, things uh, together again. So uh, my main question here to everybody, and thanks to Sebastian for a really fine opener. Uh, is uh, don't we need an extra session here? Thanks very much for, for those <laughs> thoughts. I uh, I expect we'll be we'll be discussing this um, in in uh, in later emails and correspondence and and sounds like a great idea to me. Thank you very much for for your thoughts. Um, finally, uh, I'd like to introduce our final discussant, um, Jan Zinkowski. Um, please uh, take the floor. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, yes, Sebastian, uh, I also enjoyed your presentation uh, very much. Uh, I apologize for having um, entered the discussion a bit later. I dropped in when you were discussing your social semiotic perspective, so I hope I only missed the introduction. So if I um, have a comment that overlaps with something you already said, please forgive me, it was a personal issue, so I hope you, uh, you can pardon me for that. Um, now, um, concerning um, yeah, some of the, the ideas that I had when I was listening to you, um, of course, um, well, I noticed that you found your way to that book that Ruth and I edited uh, on populism. Uh, I was obviously very flattered to see that, but I, um, and I, yeah, because of that, of course, you probably know that the ideas concerning populism that you just articulated, that they come very close to some of the ideas that, that the perspectives that we developed in that book as well. And so um, I fully agree with you that uh, populism should be approached more as a narrative. I wouldn't personally use the notion of ingredient because that gives perhaps the suggestion that you can simply take it out of a certain discourse or narrative mm. without really altering the you know the, the discourse that discourse that we call populist but i do agree with you that it's a matter of performance eh, that, uh, that if you understand how uh, different forms of populism populist discourse and so on are constructed that you need to pay attention both to say the structures that you investigated and that you labeled using your social semiotic perspective um, on the one hand and the performative aspects as well of style and so on eh? so at that level, I don't really have something fundamental to contribute, I think, but I, I was wondering about something um, and it, it, this connects perhaps a bit with, to some extent, with some of the things that, that uh, Jeff was mentioning. Um, and it has to do with the question of, of ideology, basically, yeah? because of course, we all know populism is a chameleon, if you want to say it like this. Um, it is, is something very adaptable. It's very heterogeneous as a category. Uh, but the, still, there are forms of populism that seem to generate more controversy, forms of populism that um, are more anti-democratic, you could say, than others, perhaps. Uh, um, of course, it depends on how you define democracy as well. Uh, um, but I'm just wondering if um, in focusing uh, our attention to the performative aspects of, um, of populism on the one hand and structural components, whether we don't ignore too much 
the, the content of the ideologies of specific populist discourses. Because I do think that there is a difference between, say, the type of illiberalism that you find in, say, Viktor Orban's um, form of populism uh, and, say, um, um, more, let's say, forms of populism such as those that, uh, that Jeff mentioned there uh, of, uh, say, Rutte in the Netherlands, uh, who has a, a very centralist neoliberal um, uh, political project, basically. And so I do think that ideology matters as well. And this leads us perhaps to the question, how can we distinguish between different forms of populism? Eh? Uh, because of course you drew attention to many of their common characteristics uh, of contemporary forms of, of eh, what we call populism, but um, can we distinguish between you know, different ideological varieties, yes or no, and how should we do this? And personally, I have the impression that there is some work to be done in the field of populism studies on that question and perhaps it could be interesting to reflect on um, and then perhaps um, a second question that I had um, um, for you uh, would be like it's more abstract perhaps because you use this social semiotic perspective but also saw that you use you know uh, Savrakakis, uh, Katsambekis, eh? so people from say Essex style discourse theory and you seem to combine them and I was wondering um, where do you see, um, what are your reasons for selecting these perspectives and how do you see, uh, yeah, to what extent do you consider them to be compatible, complementary or uh, uh, conflicting with one another um, at a more abstract analytical level perhaps? Just an open question that I had for you. Um, and then perhaps as a last, remark, but that's perhaps more aimed to, to Jeff. I don't know if we will have time for discussion afterwards. Um, I found this, this notion of derailed reflexivity very interesting, uh, but I was just wondering if it's, um, um, yeah, what it's a derailment of then, eh? because if you say, okay, a lot of this populism is a form of derailed reflexivity, and I can see the argument there, but there I was just wondering like, okay, that, that, that you do introduce the assumption then that there is like a standard mode perhaps of reflexivity. And I was wondering, yeah, perhaps if there is some time, perhaps that's also something that we could talk about. Um, but yes, I, I will leave it at this. Uh, and and uh, yeah, perhaps you can comment Sebastian on some of these uh, points. Thank you. Thanks very much, Jan. Uh, yeah, Sebastian, uh, we've probably got uh, a couple more minutes. We're running a little bit over time, but uh, keen keen to hear your thoughts before we end. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, on on Pera Agis comedy, I, I could join you all the times you want to discuss about these topics. We can invite Landowski and everyone. I don't imagine Landowski working on a Sunday, but maybe it's a, it's a, it's a, a, a false impression. Um, um, about uh, Jan's comments, um, yeah, the idea of the ingredient, I start with that because it's uh, the easiest one. I think it depends what type of ingredients you're thinking of. If you're thinking of salt, for example, is something that you can include or not, but it's not a necessary thing to have the final product. Now, if I want to make pasta without flour, that, that, that's the point. So uh, this is important thing, the work of, of Benjamin de Klein and, and colleagues from, from the Sire Group, trying to disarticulate or disentangle populism from other things like nationalism, right? So the, and I think the, and this leads me to the second point, the idea of a thin, a thin central ideology is precisely that. Populism might be an ideology. It depends on what we understand with the word ideology, but it's never the central aspect, right? There is always something thicker that, that needs to be there. Otherwise there, there can be a, a populism if there are not specific political content. Um, about the, the relationship between discourse and, and ideology, it's, these are very, very broad words that refer to a, a very wide semantic field. And, and I think these are two, two phases of the same coin, because the only way to access ideology is through a discursive articulation. There, there can't be Marxism, socialism, communism, liberalism, if there are no stories that pose who is the hero, which is the goal or the, the value object to be reached 
and, and so on. So, of course, it, it's, it's not about content and form, as uh, Laclau said in one of his, 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 his things. There is no content without form, and there is no form without content. And we can only postulate something such as an ideology if there are discursive articulations. Uh, the final question regarding how to combine the, the Essex school and, and semiotics. And I mentioned this, it's, for me, it's fantastic because the, 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 the fathers, let's say, of, of social semiotics uh, uh, as discourse studies and, and the theory of uh, discourse theory of the Essex group are Ernesto Laclau and uh, Eliseo Verón, who were both Argentinians, studied more or less at the same time in the University of Buenos Aires. And I don't know if you were there when I showed a quote from hegemony and socialist strategy in which they uh, move and Laclau say more or less exactly the same words that um, uh, Eliseo Verón used a couple of years later in uh, La Semiosis Social, that is that thing. So I'm working now uh, thinking of a paper on trying to combine or show, put into dialogue the two approaches. There are some attempts, for example, Mariano Fernández is a, a, a colleague from Buenos Aires has prepared a paper, has published a paper relating Verón and Laclau's theories, but I think deeper work needs to, to be done. Um, the main difference is that, um, of course, Laclau is a historian and he engaged with a lot of philosophical ideas, he, uh, Hegel, uh, Lacan, Althusser, Heidegger even, that in my particular view are not necessary if you want to deal from an empirical perspective with discourses. And that's, for example, what uh, Beron does. He starts, as Landowski and as many others, by assuming, okay, this is the matter, these are signs, these are, this is our corpus, and we will try to postulate meaning based on what we are perceiving. And that's how laws and things are concluded. It's an inductive process. Whereas the Essex school depart from a package of premises that I, for example, particularly never, not always agree with. Yeah, why do I have to read a, 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 an article by Lacla about Hegel and totality and things thing that I don't even understand properly? No one does. Yeah, so this this is the the, the kind of, of connections and, and bridges that have to be to be established. I think. But thank you everyone for for your comments and and for being here, of course. Thanks. Um, yeah, so I think, yeah, we've run over a little bit, um, so probably best to wrap things up here, but uh, thank you everyone for joining us. Thanks to Sebastian, thanks to all our discussants. Lots of uh, interesting ideas um, to think about and absorb. Uh, the, the seminar has been recorded, so uh, if any of you want to revisit it later on um, and uh, give it some more thought, you can watch it again through the Smart Genetics website. Um, but with that, I think we'll say goodbye. Um, looking forward to, to seeing you all next time. And uh, thanks for joining us.